Welcome to The Launch, the podcast sponsored by Tandem Launch, where we talk about tech, startups, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. We give you the inside scoop on building a startup, capital fundraising, the entrepreneurial journey, with both funny and impactful stories. This podcast is for budding entrepreneurs, ecosystem players, industry folks, venture capitalists looking for deals, students considering a career in the startup world, or anyone with a curiosity in Deepak. If you have a research background in tech and always wanted to build your own startup, then check out our website, www.tenemlaunch.com, or hit us up on LinkedIn. Let's build the future together. And now, on with show. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Launch, sponsored by Tandem Launch, Canada's premier incubator. And today, I'd like to welcome Sam Phoenix, who is the founder of Phoenix Consulting, as our guest today. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Hi, Bobby. How are you? I'm super jazzed to hear everything that you have to say. Um, we love what you do, and we think you're a super exciting uh, person in the in the ecosystem. So why don't we start with um, maybe just share with our audience your career path and where you've where you've landed, um, and just you know we we sometimes hear about you know un- young entrepreneurs um, and they need to get a few years of industry work before they can get into entrepreneurship. Um, it's just something common that I'm not sure if that's a misconception or not. So what are your thoughts on that idea and um, how was, how was the transition for you? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's right. I hear that too. So I think, so first, I mean, career paths, I mean, everyone's journey is different. Um, and I don't think it needs to be like this linear, you know, path, or follow some sort of prescribed path. I mean, if you had asked me, like, back when I was first starting, I, I don't think I would have ever guessed that I would uh, end up where I am today. Like, I don't think I could have anticipated it. Um, I mean, like, sort of fairly early in my career, some what sort of felt like at the time they were kind of small decisions um, just led me onto this sort of standard corporate leadership track, which I was, I was an engineer, so I was not interested in that, but I just kind of worked out that way. And then um, until recently, I hadn't seriously considered um, becoming an entrepreneur. Um, but then like towards the middle of 2019, so a couple of years ago now, I was starting to feel like something was missing. Um, you know, I've been in a um, vice president of r and sort of CTO role for five or six years at that point. And um, it just, I was starting to feel like it just wasn't quite I wasn't getting jazzed up like I used to, you know? So I started to work on an exit strategy from my, from that corporate role so that I could take some time out and figure out what I really wanted to do for the next chapter of my career. Um, and I'm thinking about it. I was like, maybe this was my, my midlife crisis. Um, <laughs> so then fast forward, uh, you know, towards the end of 2019 and I was free to start digging in and exploring um, what I would do next. And I had lots of conversations with friends, with industry contacts, with mentors. Um, and I had been toying with the idea of setting up on my own as a consultant. And that just seemed like an easy first step. So I just went ahead and did that. I launched a, an independent consulting business um, focused on serving clients in the AB industry, which is the industry I was working in and had been for, uh, for a long time. Um, as an aside, I, I, I'm looking back at like what my incredible timing I had. So I did that. Like, I think I, I like registered the business in like January of 2020. I went to Europe for um, a big AV show, ISC in February, and then flew home in March 1st through New York to like shut down. <laughs> and my whole industry just basically stopped. Um, except for all of this stuff, like all the Zoom stuff, the unified communication, the UCC stuff went crazy, but um, most of the traditional AB stuff. So that's like live events, um, you know, conferences, um, museums, uh, you know, stage shows, retail, like everything else that, that's kind of a church, all these things that are AV centric, um, mm-hmm. going to the office, having meetings, all of those things stopped. So maybe my timing was terrible, but um 
during those original exploratory discussions, um, I was surprised at how many people suggested that I think about launching a tech startup because I, I really never thought of myself as like a founder of like a, a tech company. It, but I never really thought that was for people like me, um, which is, I don't know, I, I think of that as weird now because I'm like, well, why not? I mean, I was an engineer, I had an MBA, why not? Mm-hmm. Um, I thought about it, I, I began to realize like, and see like how much my corporate experience had provided me with skills and connections that I would need if I did want to do a startup. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that in order for me to be successful in some of those corporate, especially larger enterprise roles, I really had taken an entrepreneurial approach to my job. So um, I began to look at what was available in terms of programs and support, um, both in my industry as well as in my local area. Um, and at the time I was living in Portland, Oregon. And um, with, actually within a, a few weeks, I was approached by a local um, state-funded innovation incubator. Um, they look for opportunities to commercialize IP from Oregon um, University research groups. And from that engagement, I actually found that a company called MyGuire. Um, and our goal is to use the IP that we've licensed from Portland State University uh, to enable the next generation of flexible electronics um, through our novel approach to producing um, a transparent conductive film. Um, so we take copper nanowires and we coat them with nickel and we magnetically align them and then we weld them and it creates a, a transparent but um, extremely conductive, uh, flexible uh, flexible film. It's got lots of applications. So that's, that's exciting. Um, and I guess if I look at it, you know, if I look back and I think, you know, my only regret is like, why didn't I consider this sooner? You know, I think if I had the chance to do it again, I, I would have looked into starting something as a side hustle much earlier in my career. Um, like there's just so many resources available to support entrepreneurs, especially women, um, especially in, in tech. It, I think it might be a generational thing. Maybe it's it's my generation and, and maybe, the, yeah, you know, the, the millennials are, I, I hear more about side hustles now when I talk to younger people. So maybe they're more comfortable with the concept, especially because the gig economy has become such a, a big part of our lives. Um, yeah. But it just, it didn't occur to me, you know, back when I was in my you know late twenties or mid twenties, or e- even again, again, until like my mid forties that, well, I, I could be a, I could start a company. So amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's super common um, among women to sort of not imagine themselves um, as, as tech leaders, which is something that we are trying to mitigate at time launch every single day. Um, And it's, it doesn't, I I hope it somehow generationals out like over time, but I mean, I, I still think that's, that's there a bit. And, I mean, I'm with you. Like hindsight's 2020. Man, if I knew <laughs> what was it then, what I know now, I would have like taken a PhD and doing all that jazz and yeah, starting a company mid 40s. Like me too. But the point is, it can be done. Um, and so it's never too late, you know, to do stuff that you want. So I, I, I hope that our audience takes inspiration um, uh, uh, from you for that. So um, I'm just wondering about. Um, you know, moving then to, so you've got, you've got your startup. Um, now it's time to go start talking to um, CVs um, or actually maybe let, do you want to talk more about how maybe the positive of, of COVID or do you feel like you've covered that already? Um, I, but there are a couple of points. I think that I, I, I mean, I'd like to sort of share with the group of just, my thoughts on it you know we we talk a lot um I think about the negatives um of of COVID and I kind of you know joked about my awesome timing of starting a consulting business in in Navy but I mean yes the last couple of years of the COVID pandemic and yeah it is almost two years have been extremely challenging and I and I don't want to diminish any of the negative impacts for, for many people but for me personally and I think for some others uh, we've seen some amazing upsides I mean, for example, companies that were previously really uncomfortable with remote um, and or sort of flexible working arrangements have seen firsthand that their employees can be just as productive, if not more, um, when working in a non-traditional way. And um, they were 
also like forced to adopt technology to to facilitate these um, sort of like different kinds of working uh, situations. And I think that opens up a lot of doors in terms of hiring diversity, um, both geographically and in terms of life circumstance. And I, I find that incredibly exciting. And, um, you know, I'm a huge uh, fan of the idea that, uh, you know, diversity breeds innovation and like, having different voices and different thoughts um, looking at an, at an issue um, is, is all for the good. Um, and so anything that supports that is, is a win in my, in my book. Um, I also think that in various stages of lockdown, because I know like every country had their own thing and it, it kind of went through phases, but I think it allowed many of us to reconsider what's really important to us. I mean, what we really value, like what we really makes us happy. I mean, being forced to sort of step off the treadmill of daily grind, you know, the commuting and the juggling, the work at home. And not that those things um, didn't happen during the lockdown, but they were just different, like how the juggle was different. Uh, And I I think that allowed people, sort of that reframe allowed people to see what was possible. And then there's an article I read, I think it was in the Financial Times, that talked about the huge increase in the number of startups during COVID. And it wasn't just like a North America or, you know, a U.S. phenomenon, but it was like, it was all over. I think like there was another, there's like Forbes, I think, referred to it as like a frenzy. Um, And I, I, I realized like some of those companies started because someone was laid off or they lost their regular sense of income because of COVID. But others came about because people had time to think about their passions and turning those into a career or they saw new business opportunities and the changes that were happening, um, you know, because of the the pandemic. And I I think that's, you know, I'd rather like look at my world as like a glass half full. So I I try to focus on those kinds of things when we think about like what the last couple of years have meant. Um, Yeah. So I think there's some positives to take away from it. I totally, I totally agree. I mean, in definitely there's, there's a whole new way of thinking now. I mean, much has stayed the same, but also much has changed. Um, Definitely having, being able to connect with people now all over the world is something that is, is now commonplace, which I think is really great, especially in the startup world when you're trying to get in touch with clients um, or VCs that are sort of outside your immediate orbit. And instead of flying everyone, you know, flying down to Silicon Valley and hoping for the best, I think it's really opened up um, those channels. So I think, I mean, at the same time, that means there's extra competition. So now more people can access. Um, but but nevertheless, I think it democratizes the opportunity um, a little bit. So I definitely think that's great. And so, I mean, it's it's a timing thing. Again, I guess it's all about timing, you know, good timing, bad timing. Is there ever really bad timing? It's just going back also to when people are saying, you know, I should go get industry experience or not. And I think sometimes just people worry, like, is it the right time you're not? And I just want to find a reason not to do it because it sounds really hard. Um, but so maybe can you talk more about other types of timing? Like it's when yeah. is the good time to start a startup? I, 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 I guess that's my moral of the story, right? Like if there isn't one, right? There's no best time. It's just like, don't wait, just, just like do it. Like just go for it. Um, I think the key thing is, to find the one thing that you have passion for, um, because that really is important, way more important than the timing. Um, and there's, uh, you know, this is another thing that kind of came out of COVID, but um, I, I, I think it was a podcast I, I was listening to, but I, I discovered this class online called The Science of Wellbeing. Um, it's taught by uh, Dr. Laura Santos, uh, at, she's at Yale, um, and it's a fantastic course. So. It's available online and it's free. And so I encourage people to go um, check it out. But the reason I mention it is um, specifically is, is this kind of blew my mind when I got into it. But one of the modules is designed to help you figure out exactly what makes you truly happy. And it's not what we think, because it turns out like humans are really bad at estimating what brings us joy. Like our gut informs us, but apparently in this particular case, it totally leads us in the wrong direction. So, um, and it's fun taking this class because it's a you it's 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 a video recorded class with her with some students 
um, that you're watching the video and then um, you hear their responses and, and their interactions. And, you know, these are like, you know, Yale kids and they, they think like making, you know, all this money is going to be um, the thing that's going to make them happy. And it turns out like, there's like, I think it was, I think $70,000 or $75,000 or something um, was what this study had proven was actually, that was like, like the optimal salary and anything after that didn't really add to your joy. So anyway, it was a great class. I really recommend it. It's the science of well-being. It's Dr. Laura Santos um, at Yale. And I think that's the, that's the thing for a startup is understanding what drives us. And that helps you be informed as to whether your startup is something that you really have a passion about because you're going to be giving up your nights and your weekends and you gotta you you know you gotta sell it you gotta sell your idea whether you go for vc funding or whether you're trying to get a you know a grant or something um you're gonna have to sell your idea you're gonna have to pitch it in in a you know people respond to you sort of raw passion and are very forgiving um, mm-hmm. when someone, you know, they light up, they, they're talking about something they, they love. Um, I think the audience is way more, um, way more forgiving and um, way more likely to, to support you. Um, and while I'm on the topic of giving up free time, I, I feel like I should, I should um, pitch this too. I should um, mention this idea, but, you know, volunteering is, is like, to support your industry or your community, that's a really great way to sort of get your toe in the water and gain traction and support for yourself as an entrepreneur because you um, you get to like often with nonprofits, you know, they, they don't have enough resources and so they're willing to kind of like wholesale give you like projects that, you, that it's all on you. So you get to like run it like a little, mm-hmm. like a little startup and you're often having to um, sort of scrappily figure out how to get something done either by persuading people to volunteer their time or their resources or you know to find funding from somewhere or beg and borrow and I think those are some muscles that you know if you're not ready you don't know what your great idea for your startup is yet um you know if you go do some of these volunteer opportunities you um you have a way to exercise those muscles and develop those um, skill sets sort of it's a great way to sort of gain exposure um, to people and ideas and situations that that you maybe wouldn't have um, otherwise so yeah I totally agree with that notion it's it's giving back to the community you know directly or indirectly um, you know and you're right there there it's I've I've done a lot of volunteering and I've worked in nonprofits and charities and it is very scrappy um, a lot of the same you know principles that you're applying in entrepreneurship is 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 there as well so yeah building up that muscle before you really I guess take the leap but also just to just to comment on you know if you're chasing the money um, you run out of steam too fast like you know we see that a lot um, at at Tenem Launch where people who are are really driven by I want to be a millionaire and I want to be you know they say Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, but that what they really mean is uh, they want to have that amount of money um, and they forget, you know, that the iceberg that's completely submerged of all the stuff that they did in order to get, you know, that it's the drive to for the passion of the thing that you're working on. That's going to get you over because, you know, after a couple of years of not earning any revenue, you're going to be like, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, unless you really are like, I'm going to do this whether I make money or not. Um, yeah. and, and that's the key. And just also know for those who don't have their own idea, you can come to Tana Launch and we've got plenty <laughs> of IP ideas. <laughs> if, if that's your only hurdle, then the police, please, please, uh, get in touch with me. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's a good example, right? I didn't have an idea necessarily for Maguire. It was this, um, tech incubator that came to me and said, Hey, this technology could be you know, applied to displays, which is your world, like, what do you think? So I didn't necessarily have this, like, driving (laughs) desire to start up a company that makes transparent films, but it is, it's an, it it applies to, you know, the area that I am passionate about, which is is display technology, that's, that's been my career. So yeah, I mean, the fact that you guys have kind of this, um, almost like a, uh, like a cafeteria plan of, like, of ideas, and you just need, and looking for that, um, those startup energy and then the people to come 
join and, and, and take these companies to, to the next level. I think that's, again, I didn't even know things like Tandem Launch existed before. So I, mean, I think that's really exciting. Yeah, I mean, we're rare, right? And the the model, the business model is rare. So yeah, it's it's getting the word out is is definitely key that we're a place where we're we're an opportunity um, uh, where one does not, you know, originally exist. But um, I mean, yeah, it's it's very much in line with, you know, trying to start what you want to do um, and, and get things off the ground. It can still be it can still be hard when you're not ready. Um, you know, you're not ready to be pitching to VCs yet. And so do you think that there's like a renewed interest or new opportunities in, in funding innovation these days, or it's like VC or die? Yeah. No, no, I really do. I like, I mean, I mentioned earlier, like there's this huge increase. Like I can't remember what the numbers are, but it's like 70% more startups year on year or whatever during COVID. Um, and, and most of those are not VC ready. Like they wouldn't necessarily be successful in securing sort of traditional funding. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a ton of resources available to people starting a company, um, especially if it involves technology and risk. <laughs> so like in the US, there's a bunch of different programs um, like the NSF and the DOE. They have like STTIR and SBIR, which are specifically targeted at new innovation that have a lot of technical risk and would not fly, VC would not be interested. Um, and then earlier this year, you know, the Biden administration noted that the U.S. had fallen behind in funding R&D. Um, and so that um, that bill that just got signed into law had billions of dollars for research innovation in, in, in it. And um, that was like planned to be like the country's biggest increase in, in sort of federal non-defense R&D spending, which is super exciting. So like I know... The phase one NSF, SBIR, STTR, I think is $256,000 you can get. Um, and it's a fairly low um, bar. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of competition, so I shouldn't uh, trivialize that. There's a lot of competition for the money, but if you have an idea, it, you don't have to have it all thought through as far as like the technical um, viability of it. But if you have, you know, a market opportunity and you can articulate what the business opportunity is and what problem you're solving, uh, I mean, you have a good chance of, of getting it. And they have a ton of programs for training. They, they really sort of coach you through the process, through the application process. Um, so that's exciting. And then um, on the VC side, you know, like you mentioned earlier, like some of the changes that happened due to lockdown have also kind of democratized, if I can ever say that word, um, the process. Of, it sort of resulted in increased opportunities and exposures for startups. Um, I mean, it used to be it was very much a boys club and you had to fly to New York City or Silicon Valley, pitch your ideas uh, to a VC in person. And now they're so used to these pitches happening over Zoom. It's like the genie out of the bottle. They don't want to go back to the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. meetings for the initial like mm -hmm. pre-screenings um, because they can do so much more of them and the barrier um, is so much lower, both for the startup because in terms of cost, they don't have to fly anywhere, but also for yeah. the VC, they can just knock through a lot more sort of, of these pre-screen pitches. So that does mean that your pitch has 100% on point because you only have this limited time and it's over Zoom or, you know, pick your teams or whatever, pick your UCC of choice. And you don't get that sort of water cooler time, sort of the time before the meeting or why to get coffee to kind of help drive home your message or kind of, you know, leave a taste of your brand. Um, so your pitch has to be like 100% on point. But you do get, you do see like, there's just a ton more of these, um, like even these online conferences where you would have had to fly, pay a, you know, a nominal as a startup, a nominal fee, but then you got exposure to all these VCs and you would just run around for a few days, just pitch, pitch, pitch. Now you can just do it from the comfort of your home, which, you know, zero cost basically. So. Yeah. And theoretically you can get around to a lot more of those, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, admittedly, there's. I think there's a little bit of we're going through a bit of a fatigue <laughs> at the moment, but I think you know we're as we transitioned into COVID. I think now we're trying to transition out of COVID, and we don't quite know what that looks like. I mean, there will definitely be some type of I think hybrid model going forward, but um, yeah, knock on wood, no new variants and all of that. But 
nevertheless, I think it's uh, we're on the right right path. And you know, Canada too has has a lot of different opportunities that people and startups actually don't realize that the, the at the federal government at the provincial levels they all have um, you know economic innovation strategies, and they are you know. There's a lot of opportunities um, to 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 be getting money for your startup, for your R and D, or also, like you said, just to training and sort of just how do I ideate? How do I get get this out of my head and into something that you know has a is a feasible product or a feasible business, um, and especially for women and diversity groups. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of support, um, and so I definitely encourage people to to dig yeah. into that. Yeah, I, and I said I had no idea there was so many things that even at the like you said at the local like even city and state level uh, in the states but also now I, like now I'm here in Europe I'm seeing the same thing like there's just there's just there's a lot of of um there's a lot of support out there you just have to yeah. you have to dig in to find it well I mean think that the governments understand the knowledge economy uh and that that's where that's where most of their GDP is going to come from right so it's like they better start kicking in if they if they want to sustain an economy based on startups which seems to be where things are going um so just sort of on on that note of all of those points that we've talked about do you have um what kind of resources can you share or do you know um yeah. of more specific things yeah so um the one thing because you know everybody's situation is different but what i found is like i my number one thing is i would say start with your industry association so like for me my domain, that would be Avixa for AV and SID for display technology. But there are industry associations for almost anything you can think of. And they're really great resources in terms of support and training and networking and all those things. Like I was just in, um, I was at an, at an event in person in Orlando three weeks ago um, for AV. And at the same time, there was a conference at the same, the Orange County Convention Center in Orlando. There was another conference going on at the same time for like the North America Association for Fasteners and Fixes, I think is what it was called. It is people who sell like rivets Buttons and bolts. Rivets, yeah. And, yeah. Like Thanks. it's an industry association. They have a trade show. They had training and certifications and they had exhibits and, you know, and, and obviously people were just like beyond excited to like be in person and be able to, you know, even with their masks on, but like hug each other and just see each yeah. other in person and not be doing stuff over Zoom, especially for them because it's such a um, sort of tactile industry where there's like, they sell bits that, you know, you want to touch and see rather than, um, so I would say that's a, the number one is like, go to your industry association because there will be one. Um, and they might, it might be small, but, um, that would be a, a great place to start. And then the next thing I would do, you know, kind of like what you were saying about you know, the provinces and the cities, like your local community, you know, the city or the state or the province, um, will have some sort of, um, innovation, um, group and there, there'll be some sort of satellite nonprofits that kind of pop up be sort of around that ecosystem. So like in Portland, there was Onami, which is the incubator that I got introduced to that where Maguire came from. Um, but there was also another one called TIE, which is actually a global organization with local chapters. And they, they do all kinds of, you know, they do this huge pitch uh, competition um, in Silicon Valley, all these local groups do their local pitches and then it kind of ends up, you know, you get to the, the finals in, in Silicon Valley, but in the, that's sort of like their big annual event, but during the year they run these boot camps. Um, I think they run like six weeks at a time um, for local entrepreneurs. And I, I did one just a, as a way to sort of give back. So I kind of like volunteered as like a, not really as a, a, star, a founder but more as like a founder mentor for our cohort and it ran for I think six weeks every week they brought in a local expert in a topic to help this cohort of founders with putting together their pitch deck and getting traction on their startup ideas so testing their ideas and you know they had a person from legal talk about um, sort of employment law and corporate you know sort of startup sort of corporate for formation and and um and patent law they had someone in talking about um about accounting because some of these people had no exposure to finance so they didn't know about income statements and balance sheets and taxes and all that stuff um and tools to help them with the, with that 
Um, and then they had, you know, somebody from marketing who's a, like a messaging expert to talk about brand and, um, and logos and websites and social media and marketing and messaging and all that. So, we, and that was a free, that was a free, excellent course that, um, that TIE ran. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, like these national organizations, like in the U.S. is NSF, but um, I know other countries have um, the same kind of thing. They provide grants and training for people wanting to, to start a company. And again, there's this kind of ecosystem of, of local nonprofits that sort of facilitate that NSF activity. So if you like if you live in the States and you Google like um SBIR or NSF and then the name of your state, what you'll find is there'll be a, at least one, if not more than one nonprofit that's state funded that helps startups in that state be successful in applying for these national programs. Um, and I think that that's sort of, the, again, I keep saying the moral of the story, but like, don't wait. And then also like, you're going to be surprised. Like once you start digging into this, there's just so many resources available and support organizations that are out there to help um and you know like hindsight's 2020 but yeah i i, I wish i'd known about it i wish I'd, I'd i'd heard a podcast like this that it kind of fired me up and i'd gone and looked sooner because there's just the, there's a lot out there this is the whole reason why we're doing this <laughs> so that people can get all of these early insights um without having to learn the hard lessons 20 years later um you know i'd and i I don't know um, about the U.S., but there's been a really strong trend in Canadian universities implementing entrepreneurship programs and innovation programs. Um, and so, you know, I, I there's not very many universities left that don't have one um, that, you know, if you're still enrolled on, and even staff, I know a couple of universities, even if you're just a staff member, you can still participate in these programs. So, yeah, there's definitely there's resources around you. That's a great, actually, that's a great idea. I hadn't even thought about that is your alumni association, right? So like you went to college somewhere, you graduated, but you know, you sometimes forget about it, but you can actually mm -hmm. reach back out to the alumni uh, uh, office at your college and they have, they have programs too. And mm -hmm. I know I've been very sort of very sort of US centric in my, in my answers is just because I happen to be, you know, that's where I happen to be living for a long time. I actually just moved back um, home to, to Ireland um, and I'm just I think six weeks in but I'm already starting to you know look around here to see and it's the same it's the same story like yeah I'm really because of my experience in the U.S. I I knew to go look and there are a ton of resources here too so it's it's not unique at all to to U.S. so amazing love it so Sam why don't you tell um people what does phoenix consulting do and how that might be helpful to them and then let them know how they can get in touch with you or where they can find you yeah sure so um bespoke consulting um so you know my area of expertise is like 25 years in the display industry so um and i you know i don't have like the perfect client or the perfect job i, I kind of have the luxury i'm blessed to, to be able to choose uh the projects that i want to work on and they're you know things that interest me and sometimes i make money sometimes not um but anything you know display technology related so i've done everything from um you know a given advice on patent uh litigation to due diligence for acquisitions um i've put together strategy and roadmap um uh plans for you know companies looking at expanding their product lines into different verticals again display related um i've done product and technology evaluations so sometimes sometimes some companies pitch their products um in a way that's kind of confusing for people who are not experts in the technology uh, so, yeah that happens yeah sometimes <laughs> that happens so having someone who's kind of very sort of no BS and kind of and, and understands what's happening at the deeper level can kind of translate some of those um, tech spec data sheets and, and kind of cut through the, uh, the jargon and, and kind of help them figure out like, what does this really do? And does it really do what well compared to this other product or help with, with evaluation? So I've done all of those kinds of things. Um, I also do um, some coaching um I sit on some boards and then um and I volunteer so I, I should mention I, I mentioned the industry association so I am the vice chair for VIXA 
this year. So I'll be chair um, here starting shortly. That's the Industry Association for AV. Um, and then for SID, I'm the executive vice president for um, uh, the South America and then the Northwest and the South of uh, the U.S. So SID is Society for Information Display. It's a it's an industry association for display te technology and uh, professionals, and and we have an annual technical symposium, display week, and um, yeah. So that's that's basically wow. enough to keep me busy and keep me. I'd say out of trouble, but I'm not sure I could I could swear for that. So. <laughs> that sounds fun. Um, yeah, it sounds like one stop shopping um, for all your. Uh, um, display hoo-ha um, yeah, and people so, can yeah. get in touch with me you know like you can find me easily on LinkedIn there's not very many people with the last name Phoenix that's spelled without an O um, and I'm on Twitter occasionally um, and you can email me it's 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 a very complicated it's sam at phoenixconsultingllc.com but yeah probably the easiest thing is for people just to find me on LinkedIn and um, message me on there and I'll, I'll get back to them lovely fantastic well, thank you so much, Sam, for joining us on this podcast. Um, and I hope everybody um, took some notes because uh, lots of good learning lessons here. And um, a big thank you to our loyal listeners and new audience members. Um, your time is valued. You can um, find Tana Monch uh, on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, the most important one. <laughs> 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 and um, so uh, just a small reminder for people, if you have a technical background, a master's PhD, and you'd like to start your own startup, then uh, hit me up on LinkedIn at Bobby Bedochka, and I can tell you about all the amazing opportunities for you at Tenem Launch. So thank you again, Sam, and um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. We hope you had fun and gained valuable insights. Why don't you subscribe to the Launch Podcast today? You can share the podcast, tell a friend, and follow us on social media. If you have a research background in tech and always wanted to build your own startup, then check out our website, www.tandemlaunch.com, and get in touch today.